In this video, I'll be going over some concepts related to hypothesis testing. So in this class, we learned two approaches to hypothesis testing. The first is the critical value approach, and the second is going to be the p-value approach. And so when we're working with the critical value approach, we're going to make decisions based on a decision rule. And so in order to figure out what our critical value or our decision rule is, we need to identify the alpha. And so the alpha or the level of significance, um, for example, you'll, you'll often see is 5%, but it can also be 1%, 10%, 2%, 2%, uh, anywhere around there. And so based on that alpha, we can then find a critical value. And so we learn in Excel how to plug in our alpha in order to find the critical value depending on the situation. So let's just imagine though that we're working with a two-tail test. And so that means in our critical value approach, we will have two critical values or two chances of getting rejected. And so the little tails in here are the rejection regions. And what that means is that our sample data was so special that it fell in these small tails. And if that's the case, then we will reject the null. So, and on the flip side, what that means is if my sample data or my sample mean or sample proportion, when I turn it into a test statistic, if it falls in the middle, we do not reject the null. So just think of it that way. If my data falls in the middle here, I don't reject it. But if it falls out in the tails, that means it's so special that it fell in this tiny area that we have enough evidence to reject the null. So let's go ahead and imagine that I plugged in my alpha into Excel to find what the critical value is. And it's negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. And again, if you imagine, if I cut this in half, zero is our starting point, but that's where the true hypothesized mean is, um, is represented by. And so if I take my sample data and I analyze it and I convert it into a test statistic, meaning I put it into its applicable formula and I count for sampling error um, and I count for sample size, then my test statistic will fall somewhere on the curve. And so let's imagine that my test statistic turns out to be 2.5. So when I look at my curve, where does 2.5 fall? So it's helpful to think this entire thing here, it's just a number line, right? From zero goes up or zero goes down. So if I imagine where a test statistic of 2.5 would be, I would imagine it to be somewhere around here. So let's say my, um, my test statistic is 2.5. So we can see that this particular sample it does fall in the rejection region, meaning I'll go ahead and reject the null. Whereas if I have a different sample and it turns out my test statistic is negative and there's nothing wrong with that, just means we're on the left side of the curve. Let's say my test statistic is negative 0.75. So I'll, again, it's helpful to draw and imagine where does negative 0.75 fall in relation between zero and our critical value. So I'd imagine negative 0.75 as the test statistic would be somewhere around here. So I can see I, my test statistic fell in the middle, meaning I'm not going to reject the null. I don't have enough evidence to reject it. If anything, my evidence supports this. So we would keep the null. We would keep the assumption about the world that we made. However, if our test statistic happened to be, I don't know, negative, 3.2, we can imagine that would fall somewhere around here, meaning I am in the rejection region because my test statistic in this case is much smaller than my critical value, right? So um, with negative numbers, as they move to the left, negative, point, um, negative 3.2, negative 4, negative 5, all the way out, that's getting smaller. So if I continue to draw my rejection region, it just keeps getting smaller and all of this is uh, where we would reject the null. So based on this test statistic, yes, I would go ahead and reject the null because that sample fell in the tail. And so that's what we're looking for when we're doing the critical value approach. Uh, we make a decision 
based on our alpha to decide, okay, where's my cutoff point? And then I take my sample data, plug it into the appropriate formula, and then see where that test statistic falls. Is it a positive test statistic? I'll be on the right. Is it a negative test statistic? I'll be on the left. Just note though that whatever it is, the critical value you're comparing against has to be the same kind of number. Negative numbers get compared against negative numbers. Positive numbers get compared to positive test statistics. It wouldn't be fair if I compared a negative test statistic to a positive critical value. They're on the opposite sides of the curve. Doesn't make sense. So you wanna make sure that you're using the right kind of test, lower, upper, two-tail, and that when you're comparing your critical value to your test statistic, they're both the same kind of number, both negative or both positive. Now let's talk about the p-value approach. The p-value approach is just like the next step in that I have a test statistic now, so let's just imagine we're working with this one still. And what we wanna do then is to plug that test statistic into Excel to find the probability of getting it. And so when I, that's what the p-value is. So think p for probability. So when I plug my test statistic into a p-value formula in Excel, it's going to tell me the area that is represented by that probability. So negative 0.32, for instance, the area or the probability of getting this sample would be, and hopefully you can see it in green, like this area right here. So we're now just imagining where that negative 3.2 falls and then it's the area that it um, has the chances of happening. Same thing on the right side if my test statistic, again, we'll go back to imagining the test statistic being um, 2.5. And let's say it just fell like right there. Then again, plugging that into the p-value formulas it's finding the area or the probability of getting that sample, getting that test statistic. So again, if I color that in, then we can imagine, oh, yep, there's my 2.5 test statistic. That's the odds of it happening, this green color right here. So you can see in both examples, though, that the test statistic and its corresponding p-value, it fits in the rejection region. So whether you're looking at where the test statistic falls, like the location, or the p-value, which is the area represented by the chances of it happening, it falls in the rejection region. Whereas in this example here, when my test statistic was negative 0.75 and it fell here, that would be the starting point of my p-value and the area within it. So you can see the area is quite big that I color in here for this particular test statistic which is why we don't reject it, because the odds of it happening are much higher, um, and it falls in the middle here, as compared to my other two test statistics um, examples over here. So hopefully that's helpful to understand how hypothesis testing works. We're taking sample data, which is essentially um, the evidence we're examining, to see where our uh, data falls to make a decision. And so to recap, the rules around the p-value is that if our p-value is less than our alpha, we will reject the null, right? Because we're in the rejection region. That's the rule. If our p-value is less than alpha. The critical value rule is a little bit different depending on the wording, but the critical value states that if our test statistic exceeds the critical value, as in it goes past the critical values, then we'll go ahead and reject the null. So that one's more of like a positioning, and it just depends. If we're on an upper tail, then if it's greater than the critical value, we reject. But if it's on the lower tail side or the left side, if our test statistic is less than the critical value, we reject. So you wanna make sure that you understand the language between greater than on the right side or less than on the left side and stick with that. Note that whether you're doing the p-value approach or the critical value approach, the results will be the same. They will both say do not reject the null or they'll both say reject the null because they're using the same sample data. They're using the same test statistic. So it's using all the same ingredients or information to make that decision. It's just that the critical value just is it like a pass fail uh, by that critical value line or by that decision rule, whereas the p-value is more accurate. It tells you the strength of that decision. So it takes it another step in terms of finding the probability of it happening.
it's very similar to taking this class pass fail. So to pass this class, you need a 70%. It doesn't matter how much you pass by as long as it's over 70. So you could pass with a 71 or you could pass with a 95. Whereas a P, the p-value approach is like taking this class for a grade. So you can see how strong you did in the class. An A grade is different than a B grade and different than a C grade. So think of it that way. Uh, critical value is like taking the class pass fail and p-value approach is like taking this class for a grade. So if you have any questions, just let me know.